Joel chapter 2. I'm going to split Joel chapter 2 into three parts. Uh, basically, uh, it, and they all line up with what we've been talking about. And I will tell you, the book of Joel has got so much in it. It would be great to just go deep and wide with it. But we're going to talk about three things out of this. The judgment of God, repentance, and the day of the Lord, which is what we're talking about. And, and tonight, I thought... Um, what we'll do is focus on verses 1 through 11. I'm just going to break this up into smaller pieces. Um, so that's what we'll look at tonight, verses 1 through 11. And verses 1 through 11 basically are, are talking about judgment. So in chapter 1, the, the locusts come in and strip everything. And, and verses 1 through 11 kind of pick up the same same premise of what's going on there. So it's just another view of, of this from Joel. So we'll look into that tonight. But let's read that. Mike, do you have that ready? And I'll let you, uh, if you wouldn't mind, uh, read verses 1 through 11, Joel chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, it is near. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness spread upon the mountains, a great and powerful army comes. There, like has never been form, from of old, nor will be again after them in ages to come. Fire devours in front of them, and behind them a flame burns. Before them the land is like the Garden of Eden, but after them a desolate wilderness, and nothing escapes them. They have the appearance of horses, and like war horses they charge. As with the rumbling of chariots, they leap on the tops of the mountains, like the crackling of a flame of fire devouring the stubble, like a powerful army drawn up for battle. Before them, peoples are in anguish. All faces grow pale. Like warriors, they charge. Like soldiers, they scale the wall. Each keeps its own course. They do not swerve from their paths. They do not jostle one another. Each keeps to its own rack, track. They burst through weapons and are not halted. They leap upon the city, they run upon the walls, they climb up into the houses, they enter through the windows like a thief. The earth quakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon are darkened, and the stars withdraw their shining. The Lord utters his voice at the head of his army. How vast is his host! Numberless are those who obey his command. Truly, the day of the Lord is great, terrible indeed. Who can endure it? So there's a, there, I mean, that's, that's a dark passage, but it's straight up. Judgment is a dark thing, but, but judgment is for a purpose. So in this tonight, what we want to look at is what is Joel saying and to whom it is, say, is he saying it to? And I think this, again, specif specifically proves that, number one, there is a pre-tribulation rapture, okay, that the tribulation period is a time in which the church is gone and God is dealing with, it's God dealing with his people Israel, right? Because in another place that's called the time of Jacob's trouble. Um, it's not the time of the church's trouble, it's the time of Jacob's trouble. Who is Jacob? Well, Jacob is Israel, right? So, so that is, is, again, just proof that, good evening, how are you? Thanks for joining us. It is, is Joel is saying here specifically, I don't see how you can read this and say there's, there is um, a tribulation period that has already started. I do not see how they can extrapolate this, these verses and, and extrapolate Joel and say, oh yes, the tribulation period started with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It, it is, it's not possible to look at all of this and say that's where, that's, that's where it started and we're in the tribulation period now. It's not. Because he's going to talk about trumpets and we're going to look at trumpets um, as we get deeper into this because at, there are some things here in Joel that we'll see some similarities of in Revelation. We're going to look that up. Not tonight, but, but next time. So, Straight on, Joel is speaking specifically to Israel, and this prophecy is for Israel. He's talking about the day of the Lord. He's talking about Daniel's 70th week. And so it is 
specifically for Israel, but the whole earth, the whole world, is going to be affected by this. This is something that's going to affect not just Israel, but it's the whole world. And remember, what did Jesus say to the Philadelphian church? He says, I'm going to keep you from the hour of testing. That's going to come upon where? The whole world. The whole world, right? So Joel is saying here, what he's saying, this is, this is coming everywhere. This is not just Israel. So the day of the Lord begins the start of Daniel's 70th week. It's not one day, it is a period of time. And we would, it, it's seven years, right? It's the final seven years of history prior to the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. But in, you know, I'll throw it this way. So I, I am inclined to say now, back in the day, right? What day? A single day? No, back in the day of the 70s, when everything was cool and music was great. So... <laughs> oh, the old people now. Revival breaks out of the old people. Yes, it was. <laughs> Free bird. Um, <laughs> but we say... When Joel is saying the day of the Lord, it's like saying back in the day, it's that period of time that we all look backwards on and go, yeah, it was that day and that was so cool back in that day. Because back in that day, during that time of my life, right? Well, Joel's looking forward and he's saying that day, that's the day of the Lord. And it starts, essentially, the day after, after the rapture of the church. That's the start. That start of the day of the Lord is encompassing all that and it also includes the millennial reign of Christ, because whose day is it? Jesus is going to reign on the earth. And so it is not only, it doesn't just start and end with the seven-year period. The day of the Lord is where it starts there. He's bringing judgment. He's dealing with people. And time on earth doesn't end there, right? Because time on earth gets one more thousand-year roll, right? We get that period of time, and that is his day. And so when he's talking about that, this is the beginning of that, but it's, it's not the beginning and the end, and it's not specifically one day. The other thing, too, and I've been thinking about this a little bit, and I'm, I'm telling you, J. Vernon McGee is so vibrant, even all these years after he has passed away, and the work that he left in his Through the Bible series is vibrant. And he talks about prophecy. So he says, I think we need to see that Joel is doing a marvelous blending here. He moves right out of the locust plague to the day of the Lord, which is way out, he says, way out yonder in the future. You recall that it was the practice of the prophets to speak into a local situation and then move into the future day of the Lord, which includes the tribulation period, and he says, and the millennium. Right. Let, let me remind you that the day of the Lord is not a 24-hour day, but a period of time. The Apostle Paul used it in the sense when he said, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Well, the time of salvation is now. We're in the day of the Holy Spirit. It started on the day of Pentecost, that specific day, but we are in the day of the Holy Spirit because this is the church's day, right? And we are also in the day of the Gentiles in that sense. So from when Israel fell and Daniel was given his prophecies, you know, and there were four, four kingdoms he talked about, well, that's, those are Gentile kingdoms, right? And, and so Jesus then, he gets his turn, his to, to rule over the earth, his rightful place to rule over the earth, and that's a millennial kingdom. So man's day will end, his day picks up, and he will rule then. But I think it's true that there are some things that are specific to that period of time that also, what, what, and we've talked about this a little bit in the past, I just wanted to revisit it for just a minute, that we see how God does what he does. Okay, so in, in that, that day, there was a specific time in the history of Israel when that locust attack took place. Okay, that absolutely happened. But there's also then a coming, Joel likens what comes next, like that locust plague. He says, it's going to be as awful as that was, it's going to be that way across the whole world. And that's what he's talking about here when he, when he starts laying that out. Thoughts or questions on that so far? It is fascinating. Okay. All right. So, so Joel is identifying the tribulation period, the day of the Lord. And what does the day of the Lord look like? Joel says it is darkness and gloom. So I liken it like this when we think about it. And, and I kind of like this time of year 
I love July. I'm a July person. Uh, the sun is high, the days are long, and the shadows are short. But there's something kind of cool about the angle of the light this time of year. And particularly, and I noticed if you, if you saw today, it was such a pretty day the last couple of days, when about 3 o'clock, 3, 3.30, the shadows start to get long. Because you know sundown is coming. And think of it this way. When the sun is going down, the shadows are longer. And you can see that, I'll put it this way, something is changing. So Joel says the day of the Lord begins with darkness and gloom. And so we see the analogy of the sun setting prior to that time. So look back there. He says, um, verse 1 um, in Joel. Here we go. It says, blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the Lord is coming. The, the day of the Lord is coming. Surely it is near. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. As the dawn is spread over the mountains, so there is a great and mighty people like there have never been anything like it, nor will there be again after it. So he's saying something's coming. It's dark, it's gloomy. It's kind of like when you see it getting closer... The shadows get longer. When the shadows get longer, you know what's coming next. It's going to get dark. And I think that's kind of how we, who I will refer to it this way, the remnant needs to look at this. What is coming? Well, we know what's coming because we can see it happening. If you link this and you go to the New Testament and you see like verses in, in, in Timothy, you know, and he's be a great falling away. Well, how do you know we're getting close to, close to the end? Because we see that happening. I mean, how many? We're just talking about these churches that are declining or churches that are closing or there's a falling away, people renouncing Christianity. Famous people, people who have a stage and a platform, so to speak, uh, have a national audience who say, yeah, I'm not going to be a Christian anymore. Um, and, and so you see this falling away. So what happens is we see the shadows happening. We see that there is this thing coming, and there's more and more. There's an increasing amount of this happening. And so we uh, can use that analogy, basically, of the sun setting. Uh, it's casting a long shadow, and when you see the long shadow coming, you knew darkness is coming. Well, the day of the Lord and the tribulation period, as we see in Revelation, is a dark, dark, awful time. And the closer we get, and the more that is happening in our time, I think we see how dark that's really going to be. Thoughts on that? There was an article. Um, um, well, there's been a lot of articles about AI and the mark and buying and selling. <clears throat> and I have to tell you, I'm beginning, you're going to go, you're crazy. I actually think I like self-checkouts. Because I can get in and get out and get on my way. I've kind of figured them out that I can navigate enough here. It doesn't bother me to go through it. I had the thought, and I sent this to Ray. I said, think about this. In the future, if you have 25% of the population at the beginning of the tribulation period, there's death and a quarter of the planet is gone in population. You're not going to have anybody to work in the stores. So what are you going to have? Everybody's going to have self-checkout. Okay, you have self-checkout. But if you don't have the mark, you're not getting out of there with your groceries. You aren't going to have somebody go, oh, I got you cut. Go ahead, right? Because we always, you know, it, and I, I go back to the Left Behind books, because there was like this, this, in the Left Behind books, if you remember, there was kind of like this underground thing where you could hide. You could be a Christian, you could still hide, and they could do the work, you know, and that kind of thing. But you know what? The closer we get to it, there is, there's no, nowhere to run and nowhere to hide. You're not even going to be able to buy groceries. You're not going to be able to buy gas. If you don't have the mark, there isn't going to be anybody there to help you out. And it's like, if you don't have what you need, you're not even going to buy anything. And just like John says, unless they have this mark, can't buy or sell. Well, we can see that happening now. There's a shadow. If you want to look at a shadow, that's a shadow happening. And it's, it's you go, how dark is that going to be? I need groceries for my children. Well, you don't have the mark. I'm sorry. It's going to be rough. Well, and when they wrote the books, they couldn't track us like they can track us now. Oh, man. You can't hide. No. I mean, I don't know. You hear people, like, it's kind of fun to hear people say, I'm going to live off the grid. Uh -huh. It's too late. No. <laughs> it's too late now. If you weren't hiding 20 years ago. It's too late now. Yes. And, and I think there'll be a time when possibly if 
if it, this all comes to pass before or after, that in your own mind you'll have to define, okay, what is the mark? So I've got a chip in my hand and I can get groceries. That isn't necessarily the mark. It may, it may be uh, the technology that goes to that. <coughs> you see what I'm saying? Prior to. Prior to. Yeah, prior to. Yes, yeah, so uh, I, I know some people, <laughs> Christian people, that absolutely will not take a chip in my hand, period. Well, okay, that's fine. But as, as we see things progressing and all this foreshadowing, we may have to make a decision. And like I said, that isn't the mark. If the Antichrist is here, and, and you have to claim uh, your allegiance to him, yeah, that's different. Right. A whole different animal. Right. But, uh, uh, it, yeah. And we don't know how long we'll be here before the that's right. before the rapture happens. No. Sure. So if we're here long enough, technology is so quickly changing, right? Um, we might not have to worry about it, although it is an option right now. But it's like, I'm in, I'm in that crowd, I'm not doing it. Right, so um, I'm just not doing it. Uh, but I do stuff with my phone all the time, you know. Or you can tap and go, you know. I do that a lot. Uh, so anyway, yeah. Let me throw this out for everybody to think about. Elon Musk has got this chip, and what was it in twenty? Oh, what was it? Twenty twenty or twenty twenty one? They it, it, they embed it into your skull, and it's attached to your brain. Like, uh, an individual was able to actually, by thinking, put out a tweet no. on the internet. What did you call it? Neuralink? Yes, Neuralink. Exactly. That's creepy. All right, well, let's go sci-fi for just a second. <laughs> <laughs> if you can put it out, maybe you can also receive it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So here, here's, what I, here's my thought and what I was thinking. I've always wondered. Why is there a mark in a hand and one in the forehead? Mm -hmm. Maybe something in the forehead is very special. Maybe that's an elite group just for the Antichrist. I don't know. I'm, I'm guessing here. Thought. But, I, you know, I'm, I'm always thinking and sure. going a little wild sometimes. But uh, I wonder, there's something different I'm thinking about the mark in the forehead. Yeah. So, just that could thought, be. Just a thought. Well, I've heard that uh, your hand and your head, like right around those areas, actually uh, produce an electronic charge. So mm -hmm. if you had some kind of mark that requires some electrical current. Neural pathway. Yeah, it would actually produce that. Yeah, um, plus, if you lose your hand, well, I mean, you still got your head. Right. And these are also two different areas that you're not going to, you know, as likely have covered up either, especially if you live in a cold environment. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, those are just some, you know, examples, but... Um, I think we also need to keep, I mean, I know Elon Musk has got this brain chip, but uh, Bill Gates has got something called Quantum Dot. I sent you some info about yeah. it. And the patent number on it is actually 666. Oh. <laughs> and it's, it's a more likely mark, you know, from what I would think a mark would be. Right. Because um, it's, it's, it's almost like an invisible tattoo. But it can also administer like uh, things like vaccines to you um, just on the go, you know. And um, and he's he's actually been in the headlines lately saying that everybody needs to, a digital ID or you can't participate in society. Right. So I mean, you know, yeah. I think we need to keep an eye on that dude. Shadows. Yeah. Yes. These are all yeah. shadows. Yes. Yeah. Well, into to the neural link of Elon Musk. Well, what else does he have? Starlink. Yeah. 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 So if you get a brain yeah. chip in your head, right. kind of what Emily was saying. If you can tweet out something, they're going to tweet something in. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So they will be able to control you yeah. if you get that. Yeah. And, you know, take away your thoughts. Plant thoughts. You know. Go so, back to the article. Special mm -hmm. network. Yeah. yeah. If we don't, if you don't <coughs> prepare your children, they're going to go, oh, that's an awesome idea. You know, I mean, and I, I mean... Well, several years ago, there's Sweden and maybe a few other European countries, they have your medical record on a chip in your hand. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's how you get your insurance, and that's how you get your prescriptions, and that's how you get your medication, to yeah. get your medical care. Yeah. And they love it. They just think that's just the best. Yeah. Yeah. Well, any videos you see about this, the people who do it, 
I was like, oh, this is so cool, you know. And I was like, this is the greatest thing. No more credit cards. But no that's what. Cards. Don't carry any more. Yeah. Have to carry any more. Cards. And I, this is what I've always said too. I said, this is how they're going to fix identity theft. Oh, yeah. They're going. Yes. We'll fix that in one. Exactly. Day. You get that right there. Nobody can steal your identity anymore because you can't do anything without this. You know. So I think there's a lot of things. But again, what does Joel talk about? Joel talks about the shadows of things to come, you know? And, and we are living in that time. I like what Jonathan Kahn says. If you wanted to ever live in biblical times, congratulations, you are living <laughs> in biblical times. Um, and that is true because God has allowed us to see this happening. It is so behooven on the remnant to speak up and say, now is the time, today is the day of salvation. Come back to God now. Um, and so there's, we have freedom to do so right now, uh, probably down the road as these shadows, you know, as dark that, that Joel talks about there, even before the tribulation period comes, it may be costly, yes. like it was costly in the first and second and third centuries, exactly. um, to serve God and to, to live for Jesus and say that Jesus is Lord. It may be costly even in America. And that brings up another point here. So when you look at this and you look at what Joel is talking about, and this is, this is something the tribulation period comes upon the whole world, and you still say, well, surely, surely America would step forward. But the light of America, America, the shining city on the hill, um, is really waning. You know, the, 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 that light is getting dim. Yeah. Um, and Jonathan Kahn speaks to the, all of his books really are, I think, are vibrant on what he talks about, what has happened to us, how it has happened, and, and how this fading away. And, and it's hard to watch, but uh, the Bible does not show the USA in its pages. Flat out, I don't see it. I've, I've seen a couple little connections. People say, yeah, it could be this, could be that, could be the, you know. But I, don't, I just don't see us there. We are not part of that narrative. The narrative is Israel. That is, that is and, and these countries surrounding there. So, again, something happens to it. I don't know what happens to us. But I know we're $33 trillion in debt and climbing, so I don't think we're going to carry that too far down the road. It could be economic. It could be something else. Uh, we don't know what happens to America, but we know this, that America is not going to be able to stand up for Israel. So something, all this stuff that's going to change. So when, when Joel is talking about this, and this is coming up for Israel, who's going to stand up for Israel? Well, only God is going to stand up for Israel. Uh, and I think um, there was an article in Harbinger's today. I can't remember who wrote it. They said, <clears throat> even, it, he said it's not the Iron Dome that's going to save Israel. Israel, when, when that Russian attack comes, and, and, and Russia and the allies, uh, Iran and all of them, it's not going to be the Iron Dome that saves Israel, it's going to be God and God alone that saves Israel. And they'll know that, yes. you know, they'll know it wasn't the, them that, that did that, but it's sure not going to be America either. And, and um, so with that, again, shadows, what do we see, what do we see happening around us? So, um, our history shows, American history shows, we've been a people of truth and justice here and around the world, but that is not the case. And as the world moves against Israel, you know, America, you can see this is happening in the last 40 days. You know, where is America? Well, we, we support Israel. But at the same time, there are things that we're doing that goes, you look at it and go, that's not supporting Israel. And God says to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you and right now it would look like you know maybe we're trying to straddle the fence but I don't think there's a good there's not a good fence straddle here on this four is four and against is against and I don't think there's I don't think there's a I don't think there's a middle ground on this so talking about what happens to America that may play into our future too or into our judgment you know and I hate talking about that. I, just, I don't want to be a downer on it, but I'm just telling you the truth. This is the truth. And unless the only thing that's going to save us, and it will just give us a little more time before all of this happens, is if America has a Nineveh-like repentance, you know, that's the only thing that's going to save us. So it is, there again, you go back, okay, well, spread the gospel. Preach, call, talk, 
do whatever we can in in this moment because this is this is what's coming. These are the shadows that are coming. Thoughts on that? Well, Henry Kissinger, you know, decades ago, I mean, even when he was in government, you know, said that uh, America is standing in the way of the one world government. Right? Yeah. You know, so I mean, you know, our own government has been working from within to destroy this country for decades. And uh, Biden's just finishing it off. So. Well, he's the face. Yeah. Of, of how all this is happening, right? Yeah. Um, so, well, and then pick up a verse two uh, towards this, and this kind of plays into this. It says, it is a day of darkness and gloom, a day of thick clouds and deep blackness. And it says, suddenly. It is a day of darkness and gloom, a day of thick clouds and deep blackness. And suddenly, like dawn spreading across the mountain, a great and mighty army appears. Judgment comes suddenly. Because one of two things, either God says, I've given you all the time I'm going to give you, or people just aren't paying attention, you know, and maybe both. Suddenly, and, and it says, like dawn spreading across the mountains, a great and mighty army appears, that's when it starts right there. So, um, what is coming, that thing that is coming, is going to come and suddenly, and even though we're sitting here going, we know what's coming. You know, Jesus said, in the moment in the twinkle of an eye. That's when the rapture starts, right? It'll happen just like that. And it will be people just not ready because they think they'll have a moment. They think they have time. And there'll be people left behind who have heard this message and didn't do anything about it. Or people who are cavalier about what they believe right now. Oh, oh I got, it's okay. I believe in God. God, or this. Me and God, we're good. Mm-hmm. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Where's the evidence? And, and, I, and, I, and again, I don't want to be hating on anybody. I don't want to be judging on anybody. But it's like, is there evidence to prove this statement? Is there evidence to prove this statement? Um, and what is that evidence, you know? And even McGee was saying that. He's talk, talking, he, he says, the, talking about the churches in his writing uh, about the seven churches, he says, works does not save a person. Mm-hmm. He said, but Jesus' expectation of his people are that there should be some works because of your salvation. Mm-hmm. Not to get into heaven, but because yeah. you have been changed and you want to do something for the kingdom, there should be evidence and proof. There should be work. And that's what Jesus is saying, you know? Prayer, yeah, where's the fruit? Because if I find a vine that doesn't have any fruit on it, it's not helping the vine. I'm going to cut it off and do what? Throw it in the fire. I have no use for something that's not, not producing. Yeah. Well, that was James's main point. And, and his epistle, you know. Yeah. And I, I'll tell you right now, from being, you know, recently saved within the last few years, I was deceived. I thought I was saved, you know, but I might tell somebody about Jesus once every five years, you know. Now I am compelled. Like I don't even, I don't even think about it. It just comes out. Yeah. Like I said, when I come here, I feel like crap. But as soon as we get going, <laughs> I just can't shut up. <laughs> you know. And that's just that's that's the Lord. That's the proof. That's the works. Right. Yeah. You know. Right. Right. Anybody else? I'm sitting here just running through my mind to think of how many shots and stuff that no all our animals do. It's your dog. Your horses, they're taking them every day, put them under the skin. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Take them to Trapping. the university. Oh, yeah. I had an uh, issue the other day with, uh, well, some foxes come up and live out of my house now. <laughs> but I got a hold of the guy that takes care of that. He's a good friend of mine. And he said, well, here's what I'll have to do. If you can track the foxes, We'll come back the next day, take the fox out, take him to U of I, we'll give him a number, we'll do this, we'll check him for that, and that, put their tops back on them, and turn them loose. Mm-hmm. 
Now, why trap them unless it's for... There's so much going on in the dark, we don't know what daylight is. Mm -hmm. When it comes to this stuff, I wouldn't know what to do. Right. But they can track them that way, right? Right. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's cool. That is cool. So. But this is, I mean, how common is that technology, right? Yeah. Just shadows of where we live in time. Leaves on a fig tree. Yes. You no know summer is nigh. That's mm -hmm. right. That's right. Well, let's talk for a minute. In, in verse 1, it says, Blow the trumpet. Sound the trumpet in Jerusalem. Sound the trumpet in Jerusalem. Raise the army on my holy mountain. Let everyone tremble in fear because the day of the Lord is upon us. Let me just say one thing about that. These people who have said, Oh, Israel doesn't exist anymore, so the church is now Israel. This dispels that too, because he's speaking specifically to Jerusalem. Where, why is Jerusalem special? It's where Jesus will reign, right? Yeah. I mean, it, and is, uh, it is the center of conflict now, but in that day, on his day, he will reign and rule from Jerusalem. So it says, sound the trumpet in Jerusalem. So uh, fascinating some things about the trumpet. So J. Vernon McGee says this, what is the significance of blowing the trumpet? It says, back in the book of Numbers, and we're going to look up Numbers chapter 10 if you want to go there right now. Back in the book of Numbers, we learned that when the children of Israel started through the wilderness, God commanded them to make two silver trumpets. He gave the instructions to Moses. And so we'll go to Numbers chapter 10 and let's read that. So trumpets, because we have trumpets, he says, sound a trumpet here. And remember, there's trumpets in the book of Revelation, right? And, and there's a trumpet, or the, the trump of God, right, that, that calls the church. There's a calling of the church. Although McGee says the church doesn't have trumpets that, in which it activates the church, except that one. That calls the church, you know. So, okay. So we go to uh, Numbers chapter 10. And we're going to read verses uh, 1 and 2. Well, let's just read. Um, we'll just read it all at once here. I'm going to read down to about verse 10. It says, The Lord spoke further to Moses, saying, Make for yourself two trumpets of silver of hammered work, you shall make them, and you shall use them for summoning the congregation and for having camp set out. When both are blown, all the congregation shall gather themselves to you at the doorway of the tent of meeting. Yet if only one is blown, then the leaders, the heads of the divisions of Israel, shall assemble before you. But when you blow an alarm, the camps that are pitched on the east side shall set out. When you blow an alarm the second time, the camps that are pitched on the south side shall set out, an alarm to be blown for them to set out. When con convening the assembly, however, you shall blow without sounding alarm. The priestly sons of Aaron, moreover, shall blow the trumpets, and this shall be for you a perpetual state throughout your generations. When you go to war in your land against the adversary who attacks you, then you will sound the alarm with the trumpets, that you may be remembered before the Lord your God and saved from your enemies. Also, in the day of your gladness and in your appointed feasts, and on the first day of your month, you shall blow the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings, and they shall be as a reminder to you before the Lord. I am the Lord your God. So he had a purpose for trumpets. There was a reason for them, and there was a certain amount of blowing and the way they blew, and it was to rally his people. Okay? There was a thing. So then when you so think about this. And, and we'll look at this again a little bit next week. But, but when you look at that, and then you go to Revelation and see all these trumpets blowing, it takes a greater significance. The, the Israeli people, the Jewish people, would understand that. You and I don't quite understand that, because we're, I'm not anyway, as, first, you know, as learned in the Old Testament of why they did those things. I see it in Revelation. But, that, but Revelation then kind of takes on this element that it, it isn't new information to the Jewish reader. 
Revelation, McGee puts it this way, Revelation is like a train station. All these tracks from different places come in. It's like a union station. All these tracks come into one place. So all this information from the Old Testament and some of these other re- revealings come into to Revelation. And it's some things that the Jewish people would know right away. There was trumpet sounded because there was a reason for there to be trumpet sounded. So he says, what is the significance of blowing the trumpet? And he says, verses 1 and 2, When Israel was in the wilderness, God used trumpets to move them on the wilderness march. The first blowing of the trumpet was a signal that everyone should get ready to march. When the pillar of cloud would lift and move out, they would take down the tabernacle. Then immediately the trumpet would sound again, and Moses and Aaron would move up ahead of the tribe of Judah, and the ark would go out ahead of them. You will remember that Israel was encamped around the tabernacle on four sides, three tribes on each side. Now each section would move out in turn, signaled by the blowing of the trumpets. Actually, to get the whole camp to march, the trumpets were blown seven times. Now, when we come to Revelation, the final book of the Bible, we find that the blowing of trumpets again. Although some expositors feel that this is in relation to the church, there is no blowing of the trumpet for the church in Revelation. The sound of the trumpet at the time of the rapture will be the shout of Christ himself. He says, like a trumpet with the trump of God. Uh, But the seven trumpets in Revelation have nothing to do with the church because the church isn't here. The church is gone at that point in time. And again, I throw that in as evidence to say to these people who say there is no pre-tribulation rapture. Then explain this to me. You know, take them back there and say, I mean, if you had somebody to actually talk to. I see them all on videos. I can shout at the video. It doesn't do me any good. But, it, you know, it's like, explain this. How, how can that be? Because that specifically relates to Israel. We are not going to be here. The church is not here. And is so to superimpose, so to speak, the church, where it's specifically talking about Israel in Revelation, is wrong. It's, that is not right. Because the church is gone. This is Israel. This is God in Israel. And that's Daniel's 70th week. And I think, I think I'm so adamant on that because I see this, like we've talked about before, I see this rising up of these people who are not pre-tribulation uh, rapturists. And they are basically all millennials. And they basically say the church is going all the way through. But it's not just that it's their opinion. It's that they are so um, becoming a bit... Uh, not hostile, I'm losing a word here, but they're just adamant on that point and they just refuse to look at anything else except they think that they're right. And I'm going, I don't see it. Scripturally, I don't see it. I get different interpretations. Totally understand that. I don't see that point. I just don't see it. So, thoughts on any of that? And and it's important to look at all of it. Mm -hmm. You know, to be open-minded. Absolutely. You know, I may be going down the wrong track here, but I'm like you. Uh, I've read all the different types of uh, tribulation, post, you know, mid, everything. and the only thing that makes sense is pre-tribulation rapture. Yeah, yeah. I don't, let me put it this way, I don't think I could be dogmatic on the point of pre-tribulation rapture unless I understood what the others were. Right. And I understand what the others are because I've, I've read to understand them. I'm going, that ain't right, and that ain't right. So this one's right, and I'm solid on it, right? I, that's, that's how. That's, that's why I like to... Uh, Pentecost book. Yes. Because he, he goes through all of them and then tells you why he thinks the pre-tribulation rapture is correct. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. I would never shot somebody down on it, but I, I wouldn't mind having a great conversation with somebody about it at some point, you know? Well, the church is the bride, right? Yes. Is Jesus a wife, Peter? <laughs> no. <laughs> Good oh, point. Man. Oh, oh, Good point. Uh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Good point. Uh, <laughs> Never heard that one. Yeah, uh, that's right. good. Yeah. Original Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got it from somebody else. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? All right, let's move on. Again, this is McGee. I'm really relying heavily on, on him in this section right here. He says, Here in Joel's prophecy, he says, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Why? He says, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord comes. It is near at hand. You see, after the Lord calls his church out of the world, he will turn again to the nation of Israel, which becomes the object of worldwide anti-Semitism. 
This is the beginning of the day of the Lord. So McGee wrote that 50 some years ago about anti-Semitism, and in the last 40 days, Matthew pointed out it's been 40 days since then. Look at what has happened in the rise of anti-Semitism worldwide over this. Talk about return of the gods. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. So again, what are the shadows that we see? Well, that's one of the shadows that we see. Because it's going to be the world against Israel at that time, or Israel against the world. And God protects them. He gets them through. He, he you know, has, all, has his 144,000 that, that go out and evangelize around the world. There are people that have come to the Lord, but he's using Israel to do it. That is not the church. Thoughts, question on that? Yes. Well, I mean, Jerusalem will become a burdensome stone, mm -hmm. and everybody that comes against it will be dashed to pieces. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, the church has nothing to do with Jerusalem. Right. You know, it was birthed there. That's about it. Right. You know? But it'll be the centerpiece, and that's where Jesus rules, you know. And we will be, we will be part of that millennial kingdom, yeah. but we'll be serving in, in the various capacities and, and what all, you know. We'll get into that another time. Anybody else? So one more thing here he talks about. So he talks about this army, Joel does. Go back to Joel chapter 2. And when you look at, at that, that invading army and how, um, when you literally look at what it says about them, um, there's a great mighty people. There has never been anything like it, nor will there be anything like it again to the years of many generations. So there again, just take that line. Right. There will not be anything like that again. This is not a, a one-off that things get better. Something happens. This is a total, complete, this is, this is some finalization. This is finality in what he's saying here. So how do you know this is the tribulation period? Take that line alone. And, and work that against all of the prophecies. So there won't be anything like this that will ever happen again. And he goes through that. He says, a fire consumes before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden ahead of them. But by the time these people are done invading, they've, they, like the locusts did, they, they desolate the land. Well, go forward. Think about Revelation. We're not going to get deep into it right now. But you think about what the book of Revelation looks like. And, and you've got all of the plagues and all of these things that happen that totally destroy the earth. Jan Markell had a great line uh, right after that Maui uh, fire. She said, that, in her opinion, is what the world will look like in the tribulation period. Utter desolation. There isn't going to be anywhere to hide. There isn't going to be a place to have a, quote-unquote, underground kind of a hiding, you know? Because all of these things, God's going to bring about all this. Why? To take away the world's normal. Because the world, he's bringing judgment for all the horribleness that has happened. He's bringing judgment because this, the world is now anti-Semitic and is turned against Israel, so he's protecting Israel. He's bringing judgment to, to try to get people to repent. Right? I mean, that's part of what judgment is for. And, and again, I'll use this example. I have no better example, so I'll use this one. When we bring judgment to our children, what is the purpose of bringing judgment to our children? Not to totally separate them, but to bring them back to us, right? Now I told you, now go to your room, or whatever, whatever the judgment happens to be, right? And you do that, and there's a separation for a while, but it is supposed to bring them back to us, right? Because when we reconcile, we hug, and we tell them we love them, and we give them a kiss, and all that, you know? Um, and that is what God is wanting to happen with, with judgment. He wants people to come back to him. Now, for the unrepentance... That is judgment now, and it sets up for eternal judgment later because they've, they've not, I mean, and, and, and I know preachers don't talk like this anymore, but I'm just telling you what happens. There's not another chance. You have this life 
to accept Christ as Savior and make things right, and you don't get another chance. It is appointed for once a person to die, and then comes the judgment. And if we don't get it now, there is no other place. There is no other place on the other side to get repentance. And so with that, that is supposed to make us feel like we're all looking like we feel right now. That is exactly what that's supposed to do. Because we are to, to understand there is somebody we answer to. There is somebody we'll, we will have for everything we do at some point. There are one or two places, either the judgment seat of Christ, which you want to be at, or the white throne judgment, which you do not want to be at. We will have an accounting for our life. And so what God is doing through hard times, through this stuff that's about to happen, and, and stuff that's happening in America now, that doesn't seem to be getting everybody's attention. So what happens? It gets a little more intense, doesn't it? Because that's what we do to our kids. I told you. And our voice goes up the second time. And our voice goes up the third time. And if there's a fourth time, it, it's, it's, it's uh, utter judgment that comes, right? Because I told you. And, and that's where it's at. And that's what God's trying to do. He wants what Peter says. He wants everyone to come back to him in repentance. He's being patient. But we're not paying attention. Or there's a lot of people not being taken. Now, I will say this. There's something happening in the United States since February mm. um, that the Holy Spirit's been moving, and there are pockets of it. And if you look hard enough, you can find on, online these stories of places where the Holy Spirit's moving. And, and um, um, Emily, when was it out in New York the other day? Was, something that, was it over the weekend or before? I think that was just this weekend. It might have been Friday. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. And uh, Times Square. And there was a, there was a huge Holy Spirit event out there. Well, Times people Square. Come, yeah. Mm -hmm. I've been there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. I'd be like New Orleans or something. So these things are happening. So all is not no. negative. There's good things happening. News media doesn't have any impetus to, no. to report it, which is fine. Whatever. You know. But that doesn't mean it's not happening. And that doesn't mean it's not real. The Holy Spirit is moving. And I think that's another thing that, that we see in our time. This is, this is the moment. Today is the day of salvation. So um, I think you go, you think about somebody that is hard to talk to, a family member super hard to talk to. Totally get that. It's sometimes uncomfortable. But the Holy Spirit's working on people. And if you know the Holy Spirit's working on people, it makes it a little bit easier to go in and say, man, we got to talk. Can we talk? I don't want to talk to you. I feel like I need to talk to you. You know, yeah. Joel had no idea. I mean, he had to define this with, with things that he knew about. Right. Like like the locusts or anything that says before them the fire devours, behind them a flame blazes, and talks about the Garden of Eden and desert waste. Sounds like nuclear war or, or war. Yeah. I mean, you've seen pictures of Syria. Yeah. Just a wasteland, you know, and yep. so could very well be what he's talking about there. But yeah. He, he couldn't, he had. No idea what nuclear weapons was. Right. So we right. had to define it with things that he knew about. Yeah. Yeah. Really good point. Steve, did you have your hand up? Anybody else? Yeah, no. In verse 4, he, he folks mentioned the appearance of horsemen. Mm hmm. Yeah. In Joel chapter, or Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 5, uh, he, he makes, he asks a question. He includes foot. If you run with the footmen and they weary and they borne you out, what are you going to do with when you run with the horse? Or what will you do with the swelling of the and the thing that will leave you at bay? Yeah. What are you going to do? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, that's that's right. So I, I just I use that first part of Joel chapter two kind of summarize all this up. And I know there's so much more we can go into that. We can go verse by verse and all that, but I just wanted to pull these things out because I think it shows us if we're paying attention, we see where we're at. We see where we're headed. God is moving His plan forward. This is His plan. And He's got the right to pull the trigger, so to speak, on, on, on when suddenly it happens. It's totally up to Him. But before suddenly happens, we have our moment. And, and I don't want to be sitting around just complaining about it. I, say, I just want to say, we see this. Lord, we see this. We recognize where we're at. 
And we understand not everybody's paying attention, but Lord, we want to be paying attention. And we want to use our time wisely to bring people to you. Yeah. You know, that's, and, and, I, and I just look at Joel in that way to say, he's helping us understand our time now. That book is thousands of years old, that writing. And yet we can see in our time, this is, this is where we're headed.